And I was thinking about this event um, about three, four months ago. I couldn't help but to think about some of the extraordinary fathers that I know that I come in contact with on a daily basis. I mean, these men are selfless individuals. These men pour their hearts every single day into their own children and also into other children. And that's why I was like, we have to have a program like this, because I get so tired of people saying, there aren't any good fathers out there. There's some terrible fathers out there. And I'm like, but I know some extraordinary dads. I know dads who are just trailblazers. I know dads who just, who will do anything for their children. And I know dads who really care with all their heart about their community, about, about just, just being positive role models. And those are the fathers that I wanted to, to put a spotlight on today. And I want to say thank you to all you fathers who have come here and taken time out of your schedule. Because I really appreciate every last one of you. And I mean that with all my heart. It's a pleasure and an honor to be amongst all of you. So we're going to have some fun tonight. And we're also going to be empowered by some of these extraordinary fathers. The first person who's going to bless us this evening is David, Dave Richardson. Because I know he doesn't like me when I call him David. Dave Richardson. And Dave Richardson is an extraordinary father. Dave Richardson is an extraordinary and incredible man. And he's a selfless individual. And Dave Richardson is going to help us understand the impact of fatherhood. Please give a round of applause for Dave Richardson. Oh, we can do better than that. Let's do it. All right. Thank you. The impact of fatherhood. The impact of fatherhood can, in some cases, depending on the circumstances, can be felt immediately. Sometimes it may take days, weeks, maybe years, depending on what it is. The impact of fatherhood. I've heard many stories about, uh, you know, from different people and things that I've read uh, concerning how uh, their fathers have, have impacted them in so many ways and how it, the, uh, their fathers has helped them to shape their lives. The impact of fathers, even the negative fathers can have positive impact. I once heard President Obama say that it was probably a blessing that his father was not in his life. Because if he was, based on the type of life that his father led, it may have had an adverse effect on his destiny. And then I've heard the other side of that, where those people that have been successful, they owe it all to their fathers. So it's about perception. How do we take it in? How do we receive it? What do we do with it? The impact of a father. I remember the, when I learned that I was going to become a father, I was so happy. I was so proud. And going through the whole uh, nine-month process, you know, of course, it's not the same as, as, as my wife going through it. <laughs> but, you know, I was, I was happy with anticipation and, you know, what kind of father will I be? You know, what, what, what is it, a boy, a girl, what are, you know, whatever the case may be. And, you know, you just filled with relations. Yeah, I hear you're going to be a father. Yes, I'm going to be a dad. You know, and so proud. And, but then when that child came out, you know, especially with my first one, and I'm, I didn't feel the elation. I didn't feel the, the, oh, yay. It was like, oh, my gosh. Because as we know, kids do not come into this world with instructions. You learn as you go along. So it went from elation to fear. I said, this is for real. But being a dad myself, a lot of it came from observing my father and the, what he has taught me and what he is still teaching me throughout the years. He's taught me so much. And some of the things that he's taught me is not so much what he said to me, but the, 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 the way he does things. And, and, and watching him uh, all my life, uh, just working hard and not being a slacker and teach, teaching me uh, how to take care of business first and then play comes after and so on and so forth. How to, be respect, how to be a respectable person by respecting others. But one story that sticks out in my mind, and I've, I've, I've talked about this story before in my church, but it, I think about it now and the impact that it's had on me throughout my life is when I was about 10, 11, 12, somewhere around there in that range. 
and my father took me out. We're from the Caribbean, so we're surrounded by water. And he took me out to do some fishing. And um, we had to go around these rocks and up and over. And, you know, to me, it was so daunting, you know. And I was following him. And every step he made, my whole thing was to match those steps. So I would watch where he placed his feet and which way he would go and, so, and where he placed his hands. And, and I'm trying to keep up with him. And along the way, as we're going along these rocks, he's also showing me things in nature. I remember one particular thing he showed me was this little organism that's attached to the rock. And he said, if you take a knife and you peel those off, you can actually eat those. I never forgot that. Right? So as we go along, we get to this one part where there was a gap. And he hopped over onto the other side of the rocks. But that gap, to me, it might have been, well been a mile. But that wasn't the problem. That wasn't the only problem. The other problem was that the water was just crashing along the rocks. And they came in and out, and it was just so angry looking. And I'm concentrating on these waves, and I'm looking at this gap, and I'm looking at the waves, and it's crashing against the rocks. And my father's on the other side, and he's looking at me, and he's saying, just come across. And I'm, and I'm saying to myself, he can see the fear and the panic setting in. Because I'm focusing on the crashing waves and that gap between the rocks. He looks at me and he says to me, come across. I got you. So finally, when I took my vision, when I took my focus off of the water crashing against those rocks and off the gap, and I just focused on him, I made that step. And as scary as it was, I remember making it a step, and I remember him grabbing me by the hand. I got you. I never forgot that. I don't know if he knew it at the time. And I didn't know it at the time. It was because I was just terrified. But it wasn't until I became a dad myself, I understood that what my father was teaching me was to face my challenges. Challenge my challenges. Come across. I got you. So I never forgot that. And I try to teach that to my two girls and my grandson. So tonight, I'm really looking forward to hear from all the other fathers. Because fatherhood is such a precious thing. It is quite a title to be called dad. And, what, and that's one of the, the, my favorite things when my, my kids call me dad. Now, when they say, oh, father, I say, okay, they want something. You know, father. Hey, you know, dad, okay, what's up? I put my hands in my pockets. I know where this is going. <laughs> but I just love the sound of dad. So tonight, let's hear the fathers. So tonight, I want to be edified by hearing the other stories from the fathers. Thank you. Let's give Dave Richardson another round of applause. Now, I came across a book a few years ago by a gentleman by the name of Randy Posh. And he wrote this book, and it's titled The Last Lecture. And Randy Posh, if any of you ever um, actually saw it, saw his clip on YouTube or his lecture. Um, he wrote the lecture because he was writing the lecture when he was diagnosed with cancer. And he realized he only had about six months to a year to live. And the reason why he gave his last lecture was because he wanted his children to know what he was really all about. He wanted them to know before he died, before he passed away. Because he said the most important thing in his life even though all the accolades that he received was passing on his words of wisdom to his children. And I wanted to dedicate this series here to Randy Posh, because he's no longer with us. And that was a man who really deeply cared about being a father and deeply cared about his family and his community. So Randy Posh, the last lecture. But before we're getting ready to move on, and one of the gentlemen I'm going to bring up now is a principal. He's a principal at Stem Middle, um, Stem Middle Magnet Height Middle School and Benny Dover Jackson Middle School. And he's an incredible principal. He's a phenomenal principal. But not just a principal, he also, two of his children also attend the same school. So, and your son is going to be there in the fall. And his daughter, she just did her entire sixth grade year there. So, he's going between both, being a dad and being an administrator at the same time. But he does a phenomenal job doing it. And that's why, please give a round of applause for Mr. Larry Washington. And his two children, you guys too. 
right here. Introduce yourselves. Come on up. Yeah. Let me see. You got it? Are the microphones on? Yeah. Good evening. Can you hear me? Can, can I hold that? Yeah, absolutely. I'd rather hold it. There you go. Okay, good evening. So I'm here with uh, Jayla. This is my daughter. And this is my son, Jordan. All smiles today. Um, the, the, the first thing I, I think about when I come up here and sitting here as a father, like, I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm, I'm being honest. I'm scared. Because I, I think about what's happening in the world today. And, you know, being a father, we're the protector. Um, we play that role. And with playing that role, I'm afraid every day, every single day when my kids leave the house because I know I'm protecting them and then they have to leave for however many hours it is. Um, I'm fortunate enough to, to get my daughter here in, in middle school with, with me, which is a, really a trying time and a trying age in middle school. And I, I automatically go back to thinking about my father. And when I think about my father, I think about something that he always said. You have to build a foundation. Because if the foundation is strong, everything else will be OK. So I live, I live like that. And so I feel like um, my kids play all sports. They play a lot of different sports. And you know, you get a lot of fathers who have those egos. And I can't let no one teach or coach my child. It's not about that. It's about the foundation. If you teach the foundation, it doesn't matter who you release them to because they've learned. They're strong. And it's about strengthening your kids and building them up. Building them up to a level to where when they walk away from you, you know they're going to be OK. So I know they're going to be OK because they've learned the right way. And for me, I've learned the right way. Um, I, I truly believe that. I was a cut-up in elementary school. As a matter of fact, when I was Jordan's age, I remember being in public school. And this is, this is a part of who I am today. And it goes all the way back to when I was his age. I was in the third grade. And I just always remember going to school and just being a clown, being silly, always wanting people looking at me, laughing with me. But they weren't laughing with me. They were laughing at me, but I didn't realize that. But my parents always told me that that's what they were doing. And I just remember, like today's time, school was just ending. And I remember school was ending, and we're walking across the, the park, and my older brother asked me to see my report card. And I handed him my report card, and, I, and just jokingly, I said, I failed. I didn't pass. Then I cracked up laughing because I was a jokester. He opened up the report card, and I thought he was being a jokester. He looked me in my eyes and said, you did fail. I'm like, nah, come on, man, stop playing around. He handed me that report card, and I had a three back on the report card. The four was erased. And my walk from home to the house, I got very emotional because I said, wow, what did, what did I do that, that I didn't pass? I was an A-B student. I made A's. I had a lot of A's and B's. And I made it home. And my father was there. And my father said, can I see your report card? I gave my father the report card. He said, you see the three again, right? I said, yeah, what's that about that? He said, I'm going to retain you. I said, dad, why? I got, that's straight A's. I got A, 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 B, and I can recall, recall having one C. And my dad said, yes, but you had a C in reading. No child of mine 
will be promoted to the next grade with a C in reading. You're going to need the, that for the rest of your life. So you're going you're to repeat the grade. Now I'm bawling out crying. I don't understand it. He, he did a great job explaining it, but I, I just didn't understand it. I couldn't grasp my hands around it. And my mom intervened. She jumped in because she was a dad, too. She jumped in. They, they removed me from public school, put myself and my brothers in Catholic school. So for the next third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, I went to a Catholic school. It was, it was an experience. But I picked it up, though, because of my father. And every, t every day that I went to school, I remember making it to high school, and I'm late for class. I'm running down a hallway, and Dr. Randolph comes up to me, says, Washington, that's going to be detention. I'm like, no, 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 Dr. Randolph, no, please, no. I can't have a detention. My father will not accept that. Give me paddles. Give me whatever you can give me, but do not give me detention because I'm not going to be able to explain that to my father because I would have hurt him. And now I think about fatherhood, and I think about every kid. I don't think just about these two. I don't, I don't think about my Julius, who's not sitting here. As a principal, I think about every kid. I'm their father. Because when you send your child to school, I become the father. So when I look at disciplinary referrals, I don't look at the kid. I try to teach people to close your eyes when you see a referral. And you deal with what's on the referral. You don't look and deal with that child. Because that could be a child who's been giving you problems all week. And a lot of times, you may hold them accountable because you're mad about yesterday. So when I look at a kid, I look at Jayla. Every time I look at a student, I think I see Jayla. I think I see Jordan. And then I say to myself, how am I going to discipline this kid? I'm going to discipline them the way I'm going to discipline my child. They're going to be held accountable as though they were my child. Jayla comes to school in the middle school. If she does something wrong, she going to detention. If she does something wrong, she gets a suspension. If she does something wrong, that she gets what any other kid is going to get. There's no special privileges. It's tough. I could only imagine how she feels being in school with your dad, who, who's, who's the principal, you know, and I, you know, I, I, I try my hardest to be Principal Washington around her. Um, because that's, that's how she needs to view me there. And I'm going to say something else about being a father in today's society. And one thing my father taught me, and, you know, being a principal, I grew up in, in it. I grew up in a straight-up, impoverished area called Duquesne, Pennsylvania. I'm from Pittsburgh, PA. And I grew up in a, in a small town called Duquesne. I remember driving. We were driving through Pittsburgh, we made it to Duquesne, and my Jordan looked at me and said, Dad, Pittsburgh just got jacked up <laughs> because of what he saw. He saw graffiti all over the walls, and he saw broken glasses. He saw abandoned buildings. And to him, he's not used to seeing that. He's not used to seeing that. But to go back to see, well, this is how your dad grew up is real. Is real, you know, growing up, growing up that way. Um, and we think about separation. I'm so glad hearing about what you're going to be talking about at your next when, you, when we talk about our kids and immigration and being pulled away from us. Um, it's, 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 it's a shame. It's sad. But as a father and having foundation, I, I owe my life to my father. I will always be indebted to my father. Um, he just played a, an instrumental part of my life. And growing up in that small little town of Duquesne, Pennsylvania, my father was from Watts, California. So my father grew up where it was all gang and 
but my grandmother had a vision that was, I need to get him off of the West Coast. He was an athlete, so he sent my father all the way across um, to Pittsburgh. And from being there, my father was a, a, a black man who had a great job. He worked for Ford Motor Company. He was a regional manager for Ford Motor Company, but he started off as a janitor. Yep, he started off as a janitor. He was educated. He was as ed educated as anybody that was sitting in that company. But he had to work from the bottom up. He had to work. And that's what he taught me and my brothers and my sister. You have to work. No one's going to give you anything. And I remember struggling at a job prior to coming here. And, you know, my father looked at me and said, man, you have degrees. You, you, you don't have to settle for anything. When you have degrees, you can look and apply and go somewhere else. You're a principal. People need principals all over the country. And you know what? I, I, I wasn't afraid. I took a risk. And my father taught us to te take risks. And I, I, I teach my kids to, to take risks and to play. As a father, I coach all of their sports. So I'm a principal. I don't leave the building early. I'm there late. I'm walking around that school late. After I'm done with practice, uh, being a principal, I go to her practice, I go to his practice, I coach Julius's practice, um, and after that, it's going home being a father again, getting kids ready for bed, and I, yep, I have to cook, I have to play that role as well, you know, I have to ensure, make sure that they're taking care of themselves, you know, I don't, I don't just leave it up to them, I'm trying to teach them responsibility and teach them how to be Adults as fast as, po as soon as possible. But again, it goes back to foundation. Building the foundation within your kids and staying strong, being mindful of what's happening around you. And it's about teaching as a father, you have to teach the people around you what it's like to be a father. Because as men, we all could have kids. But are you a father? Are you taking care of your children? I don't know what cards were dealt to many people, so I, I, I can't say you're wrong for this or you're wrong for that. I don't get into that. But how could I help you? You know, how could I help you? And it's about speaking the word. It's about having faith. It's about belief. It's about having wisdom, and before I let them say a couple words, they, um, as a father, I say this, and I say this to Jayla, and I say this to Jordan. You, you're not going to learn everything from me. There's other men in this room who you can learn from. I, I don't have all the answers, but I remember your grandfather, who these guys never, never had the opportunity to meet uh, my dad. Um, and one of the things that my dad instilled in, in all of us was go out, seek the elders in the community. Go find out their stories. They have stories that I can't even relate to. But what you do is you take that information and you build that and you put that in your information box. And let me tell you something, Lawrence, because that's what he used to call me. Little Lawrence, let me tell you something. I was named after him. He said, you have to have a switch in life. He said, I'm going to teach you what the switch is. When you're around here in the house and you're around this community, you just be you. You can talk the way you want to talk. You can walk the way you want to walk. But when you walk outside of these doors, hit your switch. And you talk that talk. And you walk that walk. And you be able to sit in the company of whoever and be a part of that conversation and be proud to be in that conversation and be proud that you're ed educated. Be proud that you're who you are. Be proud to be a father. And I could sit here in front of you and definitely tell you I am a father to these kids and to many other kids who are in my company.
If I could reach you, I could be your father. And I will treat you that way. I love kids. I love my job. My job. I love my job as a father. Every day, I love my job. I love these guys. Like, they, they know it. Jayla, what's something that you could say that stands out about me as your father? Um, something that I could say about my dad is that, like he said, he always tells us to be ourselves and that he always reminds us of how much he likes us and how much he wants us to do our best and how he wants us to succeed in life like how he did. Jordan, he, jo I'm going to let Jordan say something, but he's going to have to come over here because he'll get nervous. Jordan, come over here real quick. This is my, th listen, this is, this is my one who, no matter what we're doing, he's looking around trying to see where I'm at. I, I don't know. He's going to have to get out of that, though. But what do you think about me being your dad? What do you think? You take us from places. Different places? Fun. And you do stuff with us? Like what? What about your sports? Um, you teach us sports? So, okay. Here, here, listen, you know what he's going to do? Soon as we leave here, he's going to say, Dad, you know what? I should have said this. I should have said that. I should have said that. I'm going to say, Jordan, well, you had the chance to shine. You, you, and you, you didn't seize the moment. You know, you got to seize the moment. And again, look, you, when you think about fatherhood, that's what you got to teach you. Seize the opportunity. Seize the moment. When it's your time, you got to shine. And again, Jordan, I'm going to say it to you because I was your age when I made the mistakes in, uh, with education. I was only a third grader. And your, your, your grandfather didn't play the games. And I'm here to tell you to your face, I'm not playing the game. You go to school, you respect your teachers, you respect anyone and everyone if they're in that school, you respect them. And here's what I say to all kids. If you have something to say to an adult in a, in a school, you don't just don't say it. You go home and that's your parents' job. It's not your job to be arguing with teachers or be arguing with, you go home and you tell your parents and that's their job. You just be respectful in school. Like I'm telling my kids, be respectful. They, they don't get an opportunity to go into school and Jayla can't pull out the principal card. My dad's the principal. It don't work like, it doesn't work like that. Jayla's gonna be accountable. Jayla's gonna be respectful. Jayla has to pave the way for Julius coming into school. So, Kevin, I wanna thank you for this and for this opportunity and um, would lo love to sit with you. But before, before I wrap up, if, if anyone has a question, that's perfect, but that's good. But, but thank you, I, I appreciate this. It, it has been an honor um, to sit in front of you and I look forward to doing this again and again and again um, because I just love being a father. Thank you guys. All right, awesome. Questions, please write your questions down because we will do a panel afterwards. We're just trying to record everything, get everything in there. But um, I would just like to um, bring up Sarah. She's going to introduce her husband and her daughter. Please give a round of applause for Sarah, please. I'd like to, um, well, I have the privilege of presenting the next two speakers. Um, who's my husband, Gordon Arsu Duron, um, and Tohire Isabel Arsu. Um, and being so lucky to watch their relationship develop from when she was here um, was just the sweetest I always say that she had her dad wrapped around her finger before she had fingers. Um, and her dad had the same thing because 
when he would walk into a room, it didn't matter if it was way over there or over here, somehow she always knew. And I would feel inside of my stomach, <laughs> as soon as he came in and, you know, whatever. And like he, she was always, always with her dad. Um, and so I think that, I know I can tell her face, she has a lot to say about her dad and um, her dad does too. And hopefully they'll be able to tell you also about the painting that he did. So come on up guys. Hello, everybody. Hello. My name is Gordon Arzu. And this is my daughter, Tahere Arzu. Um, I was born in Honduras, Central America. Um, I, ca I became a citizen, I would say, ten, more than 10 years ago. Um, I met my wife in Honduras. She, she went there to be a volunteer. Um, my father actually started an orphanage. Um, many years ago in the 80s. Um, so I grew up around many kids. Um, my, and my father was their father. Uh, 120 kids. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but that was kind of like the number. Um, my daughter doesn't actually know a lot about her grandfather. Um, um, because I haven't talked to my father in 10 years almost. And um, it's difficult because I, I love my father. Um, like some, I think somebody said I, uh, I also own my life to him. And many of the things that I know and I do uh, is because of him. Um, but he was... Uh, Living a double life, um, he hurt a lot of people and he disappointed a lot of people, including me. And um, that's why, I actually, I haven't, I really don't talk to my daughter about him, but um, I, I love my father. And um, one of the things that um, I love most about him is um, he, um, he was always there protecting us, and he never, um, he never left. Like a lot of fathers, I'm, I'm, I'm used to hearing, you know, hey, my father just left, you know. My father never left, and he was always there, and, and sometimes he didn't have the time to be there and, and talk to us, but he was there. We knew he was there. Um, and that's what I want for... That's what I want to be for my daughter. Um, actually, this, this painting here is called The Protector. Um, and, um, you know, like the, the animals, it's, it's, they represent that, that, that instinct to protect your child. And, and um, when I knew I was going to be a father, you know, I was really scared. But I, I was excited. Uh, you know, excited at the same time. Um, and I'm sure a lot of the fathers here um, know that feeling, you know, that you have to protect your child. I think somebody else said that too. Uh, you, you, we are the protectors. We have to be there. Um, and, and that's basically, that's what the painting represents. Um, <laughs> oh, the heart. yeah, my daughter represents, you know, the heart. Uh, she wants you to know that. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I remember about my father, a story I remember, um, one day I have two younger brothers and an older brother. And um, I used to work at the orphanage. I was the maintenance director. And um, I used to build stuff and fix stuff and do all that kind of stuff. And I remember one day I was I was tired. I was I, I was working like ten hours a day, and, and you know from six in the morning till six at night. That particular day uh, we had a project that we had to finish, and um, I was there working. And he came to me and he started um, 
yelling at me and, and, and complaining about my brothers yeah, as if he was talking to them. You know, like, I, I don't know what they did. They were, they were teenagers. I think they were smoking or drinking. I don't know what they did, but he was angry. And he was telling me what he wanted to tell them. He was telling me, but in a, he was angry. And, and I respect my father. Like, I, 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 I wouldn't say anything to him back, you know. So I was just there, just, you know, just in my mind, in my heart. I was like, why are you yelling at me? I didn't do anything. I've been working all day. And then after a couple of days, I understood, you know, he trusts me and he knows that I'm going to go and talk to them for him. But at the same time, I was like, I don't want to be a father if that's what a father does. You know, if you don't have time to talk to your kids, you know, uh, so it, it was it was complicated, but I, I understood what he did. I, I was angry at the moment, but I understood. And um, like I said, uh, and I, I want to say this to my daughter, you know, I'm not perfect. <laughs> And I'm going to make mistakes. Um, but I hope that you still love me like I love my father when, you know, knowing that he's done a lot of things, but I love him and I miss him. And I hope someday you get to meet him. And um, I don't know if you want to say something about me, <laughs> if you have any... Any questions? Anything you want to say? Um, well, one thing my dad used to, well, my dad still does. He, st he used to and he still does. He brings me to the mall and sometimes I get to play in the inside park and sometimes I see some friends that were at my school. And then, like, Dad also brings me to restaurants and does lots of stuff, like he lets me eat whatever I want. And he also really does, like, he lets me watch TV. Like, one of them was Expect or Gadget. One of them was, like, um, uh, <laughs> um, what? what? You like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he sometimes cooks, like, I don't know, like, Rice? <laughs> and sometimes he actually does fried rice, which I really love. <laughs> and the first time I lost my tooth was he, like, how we pulled out our, my tooth. I kind of... We put dental floss on my tooth, and then we tied the other part of the dental floss onto a drill. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the first time, it didn't really work, but the second time, it drilled out so far, it even fell the tooth fell out, so we had to try to find it. <laughs> And, well, <laughs> sometimes he lets my best friend come over, and I f think that she has a baby sister now, so I'm really, like, excited. <laughs> um, he sometimes, like... He does say that, like, 
you're beautiful, I love you. <laughs> and like, he's like, you have to do this specific like hairdo in the, <laughs> you have to brush your hair. <laughs> You have to not get ticks on you, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and really, the most thing that he really did when I was a, well, what I did when I was a baby, um, I really like helped everything. Like I went in the rain, I, put the dishwasher stuff even when I was a baby I put it away where it was where it was supposed to go I could even reach it even though I was like a, um two months old or one month <laughs> <laughs> or t one years old That was awesome. Next, we have Keith Carter. And I know you're going to introduce your daughter and everything. Please give a round of applause for Keith Carter. All right. And then Marcella. Greetings. Um, this is my lovely daughter, Angelique Carter. I can't say her middle name because she'll get mad at me. But we call her Jojo, and uh, she loved the Jojo name. But, you know, um, growing up, we was always taught, train up a child in the way they should go. And when you part, they won't part from that. And I, I you know, uh, I was sitting down listening to everybody else talk, and the, the, one of the things that I remember about my father was literally sitting at his home going. The day before his home going, we in the South, I'm from Louisiana, we have wakes. And this one bishop missed the wake because he had some other obligations. And I never forget him stopping by the house. And my mom said he wanted to speak to the four of us. I have three other brothers. So he sat down and he said, look, I can't let your father go home without saying something about him. And we sat there, I never forget sitting there like shocked. And we was all looking at each other. Cause my father taught us a lesson when we was growing up. And he said, son, no matter what you do, you don't do it to glorify yourself. You do it to help others. You put your heart into others and help them never turn your back on somebody in need, right? And I, I, I take that lesson and I look at my daughter. I remember one day I got frustrated. I mentor a lot and I got frustrated. I said, you know, I'm done with mentoring. I'm not doing that no more. And my daughter looked at me and she said, dad, you can't do this. She came in the office and she said, dad, you cannot do this. I said, what? She said, you're going to get sick. And think about the young people that you help every day. And, you know, the, the work you put into that, Dad, you can't stop. Those people need you. I don't mind sharing because that's my dad. That's what you do. And I look at when you talk about fathering and being a father, it's about doing it unconditionally. Putting your heart into being a father. I look at my daughter and I look at her accomplishments and I smile every day. I look at this young lady and say, wow. Every day she wake up, I call her princess. Every night before she go to bed, I call her princess. Why? Because I want her to know when she grows up, and she goes into the world, she needs to be respected as a princess. And that's a lesson we, a lot of times, fathers forget to teach their children. You know, I always tell her, education is important. You know what? 
I, a funny story. She came home one day, preschool. Dad, what's a yell? And I looked at her. She, she used to always say, I'm going to be better than y'all. You and mom can get all the degrees y'all want, but I'm going to be better. And I said, how are you going to do that? She said, I'm going to be better. And the thing I'm going to be better is because I'm going to be better than a man because I'm going to be my own boss. <laughs> and I said, okay. And so she said, what's a yell, Dad? I said, I don't know. I said, Yale is a university, Ivy League, big time. She said, nah, Dad, what's a yell? And remember preschool. And I looked at her and said, why? She said, because I'm going to be a Yale alumni. And I looked at her and I said, really? She said, yeah. So I thought it was a week and done. <laughs> nah, she got to kindergarten. And, 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 and this is just from being a father. She got to kindergarten. I never forget her first paper she got. And she said, Dad. I picked her up from school that, that evening. She said, Dad, we need to really talk. Let's just skip lunch. Because I always took her out for a snack, right? Let's just skip the snack and go home. I said, nah, we could go to have a snack. So we went to have a snack. And she rushed through that snack. And she looked at me. She said, Dad, it's time to go. I got to talk to you. Now, this is her first time getting a graded paper. So we get home. She put her books down. She said, Dad, look at this. I went through this paper over and over and over again. And I can't see why I got C's. Do you realize my academic career is over? And then she fell on the floor. <laughs> she fell on the floor, right? Her little plaits was all over the place, and her little dress, her little legs poking up. She said, I'm ruined, Dad, I'm ruined. And I looked at her, I said, baby, let me see. And I'm looking at this paper, I'm looking at this paper, I'm trying to say, it's all right. I couldn't figure out why she had C's. And then it clicked. You're in preschool. This is correct. So she jumped up, and she, when she jumped up, and she stood up, she said, so you telling me I'm still good? I said, yeah. <laughs> you know what, though? We laugh, but she's, the dad set the standard for your child, right? You set that pathway. And when I look at being a father, I look at how I set the standard and the pathways I set for my daughter. And you know what? Ever since that one C incident, she has never got nothing under the A in school. She just moved on to high school, straight A's all the way through. And you know what? If she get an A, my, uh, an a she want to know why it wasn't a plus. If she missed something, she want to know why. Why? Because she see us challenge every day. But you know, and, 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 and then I look at the other kids I mentor, right? And I, yeah, just Sunday was Father's Day, and I, I look at their successes. And when they, Father's Day, I got one, I just let her read one. And I got one from a young man I mentored. He's in his, what, almost 30, 40? But he's talking about being a father and learning how to be a father. Right, and he said, it wasn't for you. When we was over the, on the ride over, she was saying, Dad, you know a father is not biological. It's commitment. And it's how you commit to people. And I was like, you know, you, you got a point there. And she said, you commit to a lot of people. And I was just reading it. He said, the time you put into me is what taught me how to be the father I am. And then I had one from a young lady, and she was thanking me for being a father to the fatherless. And she was saying, the path you put me on is the reason I'm here today, where I'm at today. And when I look at my daughter in the day, she told me, don't give up, Dad. Keep pushing, because I don't mind sharing you, because I know what? I got you 365 days a year. She said, that little time you give them, it doesn't matter because I wake up, I see you. I go to bed, I know you're there. And, you know, you look at fatherhood and I look at her, you know, I always say, wow, she's doing it. 
you know, and you training them up. When you training them up, going back to that statement, train them up. How much heart and desire do you put into your child? A lot of people say, oh, I'm a father. What have you done for your children lately, though? I'm going to let my daughter talk to y'all. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I'll talk to you later. So my dad's a great dude. He's an awesome dude. And I'm an only child, so I don't got to share with no siblings. I don't have to share with anybody. But when I told him that he can't give up on other kids, I thought to myself, you've been doing this way too long. No, you can't give up. And I said, if you give up on all the kids that you've mentored and all those who need to be mentored, you're going to get sick. And I told him that. I was like, you're, you're not going to stay healthy if you give up on kids who need to be mentored. I was like, you're going to get sick. And he's like, no, no, I'll be fine. I was like, try it. He didn't try it. He kept going. And I smiled, and I said to myself, I told him that. I told him. I wasn't trying to be cocky. I was just saying that he was, he's too good of a dad. Not saying, like, too, too good, but he treats other kids who aren't his biological children as they were. And I'm really happy I have a dad like him. And I remember this one time that we were sitting on the couch in our living room, and we were just watching a regular TV show, and I got up. I think I went and got a snack. And he was so focused on the TV because it was a TV show that we really liked. I can't remember what it was. But then I came back, and I kind of jumped on him. And it was kind of like we just smiled at each other because we were so happy. And it was a time when my mom was... She was on her way home, and we were both getting hungry at the same time. So it's kind of funny how we were so connected to each other that we're just, we know what each other's thinking. Like, he might have me read something, or I might read some, or I might have him read something of mine, or he'll have me read something of his, and we'll look at each other, and we'll know. We both think that it's good, or we're just synced in such a good way that we know what each other's thinking and we know how each other's feeling. And sometimes he'll walk in the house and even if he has a smile on his face, he might walk around like he's really happy, but I'll know that he might not have had the best day. Maybe someone made him frustrated or he didn't get a task done that he wanted to. And I'll try and cheer him up. And normally after that, we kind of either watch TV or we'll just talk about each other's day and then we'll just have like a really fun time. And I really value the time that we have alone together because sometimes you just need that alone time with someone who's very close to you and who's a father to you and he's my awesome dad. So that's all I got to say. Jeez, did you get that? <laughs> All right. You know, I was reading this thing from an unknown author, and and the title of it, of the title of the poem was called "What Makes a Dad." What makes a dad? God took the strength of a mountain, the the majesty of a tree, the warmth of the summer sun, the calm of a quiet sea the generous soul of nature, the comforting arm of night, the wisdom of the ages, the power of the eagle's flight, the joy of the morning and spring, the faith of the mustard seed, the patience of eternity, the, the depth of a family need. Then God combined these qualities. When there was nothing more to add, he knew his masterpiece was complete. And so he called it dad. Marcella, 
please give us some words of wisdom and closing out on these powerful, extraordinary fathers and daughters and some of their sons as well. Give my give myself a round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, and a very special thank you to um, every one of you dads who came up here and shared um, what it's like to be a dad. Um, and to you, uh, young lady, you like hit home on so many different levels about sharing your dad and what it means for your dad to also share his wisdom with other people. Uh, my father couldn't be here tonight and I, I don't even call him father unless I'm being sarcastic and I say, father, father, can you come here? Um, but I am daddy's girl. Uh, that, that's my dad. He's my heart. I always say that my dad never had a son, but I was the closest thing to it. So I know how to fish. I bait my own hook. Um, I play sports. Um, I was that boy, so to speak. Um, but I kind of wanted to shift the conversation a little bit tonight. Um, I have my uncle and my cousin here, and I'm so going to try not to bring you guys to tears. But I, I want to recognize um, the different men that we have in our lives who are not your biological fathers, but who play a major father role, a major dad role in our lives. Um, my uncle Rich, who's here tonight, um, my love of R&B music comes from him. My dedication to my job and to paying myself first before I pay anybody else. Um, knowing that hard work will yield um, all kinds of different fruits of your labor. I learned that from my Uncle Rich, um, and I thank you so much for that. Um, and try not to cry. Your presence in my life. I remember um, my father's mom got really sick, and I had to move to Baltimore City. I was the only person in my family that could do so. Um, we knew she didn't have long to live, and I just I made the move. It was a Friday night. Um, I was on the Eastern Shore in Maryland, and I went to go see my grandmother. She was in Baltimore at the hospital, and the doctors and the social workers came in and said, if nobody can stay with her, we're going to have to put her in a nursing home. My grandmother wasn't having it. She was never the kind of woman to be like, oh, okay. No, Miss Lee wasn't having it. Um, so I said, okay, well, I'm, I can step up to the plate. I'm going to do this, and I did that. And my father was so grateful for me taking on that role of granddaughter and caregiver. And there were moments where my grandmother didn't remember who I was. And we'd be in the house together and she'd say to me, I, I, don't, I don't know who you are, but thank you for, for being here with me. Um, my dad and I had many conversations on the phone where we were crying because, you know, obviously what's going on with his mother, but also because I was his girl who stepped up and was able to let her go in peace the way that she wanted to. Um, my Uncle Rich, I remember I called him on several occasions, um, feeling completely defeated, not knowing what is my purpose here and what am I doing, and this is absolutely heartbreaking to see. And him telling me how proud he was of me and that, you know, Marcy, you're doing great things, girl, and you just, you gotta be strong, you gotta be strong, and I'm here for you anytime you need me, and you've always been there for me. Um, he makes the most amazing rice and eggs. And if you don't know what rice and eggs is, I'm really sorry for you. He makes amazing rice and eggs. And it might sound weird, but nobody cooks tater tots and french fries like my Uncle Richie does. Nobody does. Um, so I, I want to take a minute to recognize you as being another dad for me because I, I would not be who I am today to be able to stand so strong uh, for the many kids that I also work with. Um, I work with kids who have um, mental health issues and are in crisis more times than not. Um, and being able to go to work every day and say, okay, no, it's not about the paycheck. The paycheck, sure, it's great, it's cool, but the job itself, you're here to do something for other people. Just like I was there for my grandmother, just like I continue to do every single day, you've given me that strength to remember that it's bigger than me. My cousin Derek is also here tonight. Derek, thank you so much for your support in coming. Um, my cousin Derek, I remember when we, were, when we were kids and it was me and my cousins, Derek used to be like, okay, um, you guys wanna come with me? Yeah, Derek, we wanna go with you. We'd get in the car, we'd go to Delaware. He told us one day, we're gonna go to the beach. So we put on our bathing suits and we're all excited and yeah, we're going to the beach with Derek, it's gonna be fun. Derek took us to Six Flags that day. We went to Great Adventures. And I don't know if you guys remember, but 
this Great Adventures in New Jersey, when you first entered in, there were animals everywhere that were kind of free, free, free range, you know, no, no real limits other than your car doors and your windows. Um, and I just remember we had so much fun every time Cousin Derek wanted to do that. Um, anytime that I'm facing personal challenges in my life, I call my voice of reason. Um, my cousin Derek has a very, very level head. Um, and he, he's always there to give me that piece of advice that, that I need or, you know, D, what am I, what am I missing here? And he says, you know, Sella, you got to take care of you. You got to make sure that, you know, you're doing what you got to do for you. Um, you know, you, you always be kind. And if there's ever a conflict, you make sure that you are solution focused. Um, and I think that that's such an important lesson to learn in life and to carry with you no matter what the conflict is, whether it's in a relationship with boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, girlfriends, um, people at the office. The, the, such an important thing is, okay, this is our problem, but what is our solution? Where are we, are we solution focused right now? Um, and that was something huge that I had learned and was able to take from you. Thank you. Um, I meet a lot of kids every day who don't have fathers, uh, whether they passed away or they're simply not there. Mom and dad don't get along. We all know that there are many different reasons that go behind that. I can't help but stand here and feel completely blessed that I've had so many amazing men in my life who have been able to teach me these lessons, that school is important. Have faith in God. You can reach for the stars and reach for the stars and beyond that. Um, another one of my cousins who is also um, my, my cousin Derek's brother, uh, he plays another dad role in my life, my cousin Chris. Chris is always saying to me, Stella, come on. Or he calls me a fat kid because we both love snacks, we love to eat, and that's just, that's our thing. Um, but, you know, Chris is another one. He teaches me um, how to be calm, how to be kind, to be patient. Good things will come. Um, and then the, the, the other father figure that I really feel the need to, to address um, is a retired New Haven police officer, and that's my Uncle Rob, who is down in Florida, so he he's obviously can't be here tonight. Um, my Uncle Rob took uh, my siblings and my cousins and I for summers at a time because my parents had to work. My parents were very, very hard workers, and they had to keep a roof over our heads. So in the summertime, we went to Uncle Robbie's house. and. Um, I remember when I was a kid, we, some of us, I should say, some of them, didn't have rhythm. Um, and I remember we were, we were trying to learn how to do the Tootsie Roll and the Butterfly, and Uncle Robbie saying, all right, now squat down. And we just looked at him like, you want us to do what? We're girls. We're girls. You want us to do what? But teaching us how to dance in those moments, um, these are things that I never forget, is how to be fearless. And so what? You're a girl. You can do it just like anybody else can. Do what you got to do. Another man who taught me um, about work, working hard. But most of all, what all of these men, what my dad, what they've all taught me is the power of family. The power of family, community, tribe. That's my family. They're part of our community and they've helped to build me up to the woman that I am today. My cousins told me, well, Mars, you know, you stand up in front of people and you, you command their attention and, and keep doing what you're doing and, and you're doing amazing things with these kids and, and with your public speaking. And this is what fuels me to keep doing what I'm doing every single day is because of, yes, the women in my life, because mom, grandma, I did not forget you guys, <laughs> but the men in my life the dads in my life, the many dads that I am blessed to have. Um, you know, as with any family, you, you have a lot of conflict that goes on in parents and children that don't see eye to eye. Um, and that, that's something that happened with my family. And it was very important this past Father's Day for me to remember the dads that I've had the many dads that I've had who have helped to shape the person that I am today. Um, I know that you guys go through your own struggles. I see that, and I want you guys to know that while you don't hear it every day or as frequently as 
I wish that you could hear it. Thank you for being dads in my life. You guys are amazing men. The speakers that have been up here before me, amazing men. Thank you so much for teaching these girls and this young man and these children that you work with what it means to have a dad. Not everybody has that. I worked at Journey House, which is a locked residential facility up in uh, Willimantic. And these are four girls, they're all on parole. They're DCF um, mandated to, to be at this program for a minimum of six months. And you know, this was my first job ever working in mental health. So I'm sitting here and I'm saying to myself, okay, so they talk about boundaries and this and that and this and that. Okay, well, well, well okay, I don't really know what that means, but I'll figure it out, I'll figure it out. So these girls, they cry, they're homesick. This is, this, they, it's, it's a normal thing. Um, one girl was sitting on her bed one night and she's crying. And my first reaction is, well, why, why, why is she crying? Why, what, what's, what's wrong? Why is she crying? Staff says, no, just let her cry. But does anybody know why she's crying? No, 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 just let her cry. Well, if you know me, you know that's not a satisfying answer, and I'm going to do this my way. So I kind of went around about, and I said, I'm going to find out why she's crying, because no kid should have to cry by themselves. So I go to her, and I say, hey, what's going on? She's crying, she's crying, she's sobbing. She was finally able to tell me. Marcella, I'm gonna discharge from here in a few weeks, and I'm gonna graduate from high school. And there's gonna be a photographer in the room, and they're gonna be snapping pictures of people with their families, and they're gonna come to me and they're gonna say, would you like me to take a picture of you and your family? But Marcella, who's gonna be there for me? And she sobbed, and of course I started crying with her. And I have to thank God my grandfather, Carl Levy, my grandmother, Alvinia, my other grandparents, Eunice and Robert Lee. Um, thank you all for giving me the gift of family and for me never having to be in that position where I had to wonder who was gonna be there for me. Thank you all for making sure that these kids don't ever have to wonder that question as well. I thank you all so much for being here tonight. A happy Father's Day to you all. And thank you to my other dads for being here tonight and supporting me. I appreciate you. Is this an awesome event we're having? Yeah. Celebrating these fathers? Awesome. So I would like some of the fathers to come up here, please. The fathers who spoke tonight. OK. Like all the fathers that come up here, and you could turn around, please, and face the audience right here. We can line up right here, just right here, yeah. Okay, now for you awesome fathers, I just want you to leave, because sometimes people might have a lot of doubt right now, right? Somebody might be having a baby now, and they might feel like they're not ready. You have some fathers who, because of temptation, things that we deal with on a daily basis, you know, they feel like, Hey, man, maybe I just can't even be a dad anymore. You know, I fell short. I keep falling short. I can't pay the bills. You know, employment is rough right now. I can't find a job. Things are tough. I can't really support my household. You know, um, my wife is getting on my nerves. I can't deal. She's keep bickering, and she's she constantly on my, in my ear. She's becoming a nag. She's annoying. My kids are just, you know, they don't want to pay attention to me. Just a quote, a word of advice. Something to leave the listeners tonight, each one of you. Just, just something, because you just never know who's listening. Um, I don't know if you're ever ready to be a dad. It, um, like I said, you know, kids don't come with instructions. And um, I remember when I was getting married, uh, my father said, the only advice I'm going to give you is make sure you leave the bathroom clean. In other words, you learn as you go along. But if it was anything, I would say the two greatest things that you can give your kids is love and time. So for me, it would be um, real simple. You just got to find God. You reach out to God, and you put it in God's hands. And through prayer, through faith, through just 
God's will. You'll find you'll find a way. It 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 it'll happen. It'll happen. You know, the best advice I can give is connection. Stay connected. You know, me and my daughter, y'all started to do a shake. We can be looking at each other, and we'll do this to each other. And we'll do that, and we'll do that, and we'll cross our heart. And we'll cross the room, right? And that's just to tell each other we love them. And I always say as a parent, as a father, as a mentor, as a coach, always stay connected. Uh, my advice would be, you know, we got to think about the next generation and what we're giving them. Uh, I think about my daughter, and someday she's going to be our mother. And what I do, the example that I, you know, give to her, uh, how I treat my wife, how I treat um, her, um, you know, that she's, I hope that I'm doing a good job and she's going to find um, a partner that's going to do the same for her when she's ready to get married, I hope, in a long, long time from now. <laughs> 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 but um, if you're going to be a father, just, you know, if you're nervous about it, uh, like you said, pray. Um, that's to start, you know, and just just have faith in, in uh, that there's always going to be someone there giving you support, and there's always going to be there someone uh, trying to help you if you feel like, you know, it's too much. Uh, don't don't leave any more kids alone. You know, that, um, we don't need any more of that. Um, they are the future, so. Please give another round of applause to the extraordinary men. Now, before we get to Q&A, before we, um, I know you have to cut, turn this off in a minute. Um, Derek, can you please bless us? Derek Williams, can you please bless us with a song right now? Close it out. Hello, everyone. What an awesome program. I'm fortunate to know 50% of these men up here. In the what they told you tonight is true. They're, they're accurate in their stories. And Larry, I do laugh with you and at you. You know, it's just how we do. And I was fortunate enough to go to school with Dave and grow up in the neighborhood together and, and do music together. And um, he's been a very great role model for lots of kids. And I've always been proud of you. I never told you that, I don't think. But I always thought you were cool. I used to do a lot of uh, teaching at, at the middle school. And, and the other cool teacher was Mr. Richardson, and you know, Mr. Williams was always all right, you know. But. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, man. But uh, to my my baby cousin Marcella, thank you for inviting me tonight. I'm not really prepared because uh, I didn't do my hair or anything because I just expected to sit in the back and just mind my, you know, just mind my p's and q's. But uh, <laughs> right, she says she didn't know. We'll talk about this later, and we'll get resolution as we talk about resolve, right? But uh, I'm very proud of you, and I, I do, uh, I'm thankful for the role that we've had this relationship, and family is very important to me and, and, and my cousin Richard, and, and because of, of our parents and, and so on. And, and I'm just so, so thankful that I was able to, to be a part of, of your growth. And I tell you, uh, I used to put her right here and carry her, yeah, as a little one, you know, right here on my hip. And, off we go no matter where. She's like, as she said, I was so happy because she'd always be like, yeah, I'm going. I want to go. Those kids always wanted to go with us. No matter where we went, they were there. So you made it easy for me to grow up and, and be a father because you guys were just great kids. And uh, it was just, I was talking about, today, about you today at work, and I was just sharing that, um, you know, my, I got to go support my baby. I still call her my baby cousin. You know, I got to go support her. And, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm happy to do it, of course. And, um, you know, it's just uh, it's just good to to 
to have such a, we have a, a difference in age, you know, of, I'm not going to say, that's not important, no, but, but, you know, she was a baby, but it's, it's such, a, such an awesome feeling to have someone who continues to look up to you, you know, as from when she was this big to now a grown adult, and, and to be able to call and say, hey, cousin, help me with something, help me through this, and uh, you know, just know that I, my role is to encourage you, but you, you got to know, you got to know, I love you, and you encourage me too. All right, so you just keep doing what you do. So one thing I'm gonna teach you now is um, sometimes you gotta be ready for things when you're not really ready for things. Mm -hmm. No, just mess with you. Um, so I really didn't have a song this evening, but I did something at church, and just from what was shared tonight, uh, when Dave shared that, um, you know, um, it reminded me of, of biblically of, you know, the disciple being afraid to walk out into the water, and Jesus said, come to me. That took me right there where your father was saying, come to me. You're going to be all right. And you stopped looking down at the rocks, and you just started walking out. You took that, that, that faith step. That just reminded me of that, you know. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just awesome, you know, that... Uh, I, I received that from you. And um, just the other stories and, and the connections with, with the children. And awesome, her dad's an awesome dude. And, and that's, that's, that's great stuff. And, um, you know, you should be very proud of this young lady that she has such a connection to you. And, it's, and don't ever, I know you're the dad, and we're talking about dads right now, but don't ever take that for granted. I know you won't. Because they grow up, man. And if you got that strong connection, it's going to continue to be strong. So. And that little one just loves you to pieces. And so she's the heart. And, and um, just this whole display is, is so powerful. And, and um, it's just, just an awesome thing. And to Larry, Larry said, um, he said, put God first. So that's kind of putting me to where I am now. I'll, I'll share this with you. Because many of us, some of us don't have fathers. And I was at church this past week, and a lot of the, a lot of the church members don't have a father anymore, didn't have a father much in their lives. I love what you said, that you, you still love your father through everything. It's unconditional. Now, you've spoiled her rotten, and you've spoiled her rotten, and he spoils his. But you didn't have that the whole time, but you still love your father. That is so powerful. It's just an awesome thing. So I hope that one day you, she, you, she does get to meet him, because it doesn't matter, because love is greater than all things. Love conquers all, so. So I want to just um, give honor to, as Larry said, put God first, put God in all things. So kind of just, again, I didn't know what I was going to do. So just listening to these, these men speak and, and their, their, their children, I figured I'll just go ahead and do that. That was what was being rece I received. So I just want to share this with you. To our Heavenly Father, our Father, all right? Our Father, we love to call you. By your grace you have adopted. Now we're your children. You now receive us. Joint heirs with Jesus. Our Father, our Father, our Father, we love to call you. By your grace you have adopted, now we're your children, you now receive us. Joint heirs with Jesus, our Father, our Father. The awesome love you've shown to us goes beyond our wildest dreams. You saturate our lives with grace and mercy. And because you love, you're chasing us. If we should go astray, like a father, 
our Father, like a Father, our Father, our Father, our Father. Our Father.